What's going on, everybody? It's Brian Tripp. I'm here in beautiful Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Investing Live podcast, REI Live. So glad you decided to join us. We've got an incredible guest out of Knoxville, Tennessee, Mr. Zach Tetley. How's it going today, Zach? Hey, good, Brian. Uh, thanks for having me. So I, I got to say this, got a lot of, you know, we're from Alabama, got a lot of Alabama people that listen to us. You're in Knoxville. That's like the sworn enemy of yeah, the Alabama Crimson Tide. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, definitely not a town you want to wear your crimson red in. So I, I do have to tell a quick story. I, I worked for UAB, University of Alabama, Birmingham, and UAB played at Tennessee. That's the last time I was there. They played in, in, um, in Neyland Stadium up there. And I drove up there with my truck and I have University of Alabama um, vanity plates on my truck because I went to Bama. So I get up there, I park in this parking garage, I go into the game, I, I, was, right, I was doing some stuff for, the, um, for, for UAB, for the team. Get back in my, I get back to my truck and like my whole entire bed of my truck is filled with beer cans. Like hundreds of beer cans. I'm not talking like 10 or 15. Like they dumped the recycling bins out after a frat night. Yeah, they didn't like, I saw my Alabama tag, they didn't like me. Uh, I'm sure that that would be reciprocated in some fashion down in Birmingham if someone went down there with Vols tags. Probably so. <laughs> well, well, Zach, let's talk about real estate. You've been wholesaling for, it sounds like about a year and a half now, which is not that long a period of time. And I really want you to kind of tell, start, out, start off by just kind of telling your story. Tell everybody who you are, how you even got into the business. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm actually not from Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, I was uh, born and raised in Charleston, South Carolina. Forgiven. Yeah, I'm forgiven. Yeah. So my wife's family is from up here. Um, but uh, that's the reason we moved back up here. But um, so I was raised down there, worked in restaurants. Um, I was a logistics director for, for Chick-fil-A. I was working towards getting my own store. Uh, it was a huge goal of mine, aspiration, you know, to be an operator. And uh, here we are near the goal line of uh, getting my store and I got told, you know, that if I wanted to invest in real estate and some of the other opportunities that I felt like I really wanted to pursue and passion, that that was going to be an issue because this, you know, is your one goal, maybe your one project, that store is everything. So I uh, talked with my wife and, you know, we prayed about it and uh, we decided that, you know, we were going to go a different direction. So hmm. kind of walked in, gave my notice, uh, didn't know a lot about real estate, but I'd been uh, following a few people on uh, Facebook, uh, my buddy Jason Alt um, from a men's group. Uh, online and uh kind of reached out to him and started following some youtube channels and kind of just delved into it and we lowered our living expenses and moved to tennessee because it's about a third of what it costs to live in charleston right. and um the cash flow from my rental paid for my rental that i was staying in in, in knoxville and uh kind of cut back and started really delving into real estate zach that sounds really risky it is exceptionally risky man so we had always lived on one income. Uh, my wife was in uh, upper management at Chick-fil-A too. So we were fortunate enough. We had about 15 grand in the bank and just kind of, you know, took a leap of faith. And I've never let myself down in anything I've done, mm -hmm. but uh, I really wanted to make a change and I was burned out. Let's talk about this for a second because this is an issue that, that comes up a lot in, in the circles I run in, especially, you know, um, talking to newer people. They, they wrestle with the dilemma They've done a couple of deals and then they wrestle with the dilemma of, do I go ahead and quit my job and focus on this full time so I can make more money? It sounds to me like you hadn't done really anything in real estate. So, no, it, was, it was extremely risky for you. But just talk about that. Like, what, what played into that decision? Like, you have no idea, it sounds like, what could have happened unless you just really and truly felt like this was it. I felt like I could figure it out and I felt like mm -hmm. I, I educated myself at night a little bit enough about wholesaling, listening to some podcasts and, and some of those things. But I mean, I'll be honest with you, I fell on my face for the first, you know, eight weeks in this business. Like, dude, I didn't know, you know, you're wearing 16, 18 different hats. Do I got to get a website? Do I got to call these sellers? Do I got to do this? I don't have a contract. I don't have EMD money. I don't have, you know, you're, you, you just, you're overwhelmed and it's so easy to get caught up in that. Um, but I don't think there's ever going to be a right time. You're never going to have the right amount of money. You're never going to have the, you know, the, the, the perfect situation where it's like, well, everything lines up to go. We're going to quit our job today. And, you know, we're at this perfect magic number. If you wait to do that, you'll never start. No, I, I agree with the last thing that you just said, but you're a young guy. How old are you? 
Zach? Um, I'm, tw- I'm 29, just about to be 30. So I was 29. 26. And you were married at the time. Hmm? You're, mar- no you're married. No kids. So, and no kids. So I'm just, I'm just talking to the person out there that, that maybe, you know, maybe younger, you know, in their 20s, no kids yet. That might be something that, you know, I'm sure your, your plan B was, hey, if it doesn't work, we'll just go back to what we were doing. Yeah, I mean, I always knew that I could go back and be a restaurant manager or, you know, do logistics for another food and beverage company. So um, I was really good at it. I just, just, you know, I just got burned out working in corporate America. Like, it just got really old. So I, I, I'm sorry I'm harping on this so much, but I, I think that there's a lot of value here. I hear um, guys like, you know, I follow Gary Vaynerchuk. I talk about it a lot. Um, I, th- I think he, he has something really interesting to say about this particular point that if you are younger, you are in your 20s, and you, you don't really have a whole lot to lose right now, like in your 20s. And you've got a whole lot of time to recover if something were to happen, like if, if it doesn't work out. So I'm not sitting here telling everybody to, hey, you need to quit your job and go, go head first into real estate. But if you are committed like that, it sounds to me like, like you were totally committed to this, Zach, in the very beginning. And, and if it didn't work out, you're still young enough to where it's not like it's going to, you know, ruin your entire life you have you have time to recover from that was that your thinking yeah I mean I just I've always been really good at anything I set my mind to and I just knew that I was smart enough to figure it out and that my wife and I would do whatever it takes like when we were grinding out our down payment for our first house like we did clean cleaned houses we did whatever we could to save money so I know how to do things the hard way Mm -hmm. I figured if I mess up trying to figure out this by working smarter you know not harder then I can always go back and make more money. That's awesome. No, and it, and it obviously worked out. Tell everybody, Zach, what your real estate business, what your wholesaling business looks like today, and then we'll go back and fill in the gaps. Yeah, so uh, I'm blessed. Uh, I'm, uh, when we started uh, Nexus Home Buyers, my partner and I met. Uh, I tried about five months on my own, first part of 2017 here. You know, Zach buys houses, you know, <laughs> ever went that whole route, um, did some deals. But, uh, you know, I met Matt and what it looks like today um, is we have uh, an office manager uh, who's in the Philippines and she runs absolutely all of our transaction coordination, uh, manages Podio, uh, manages my life. (laughs) Um, And uh, we have a cold calling team and we use an inbound call center and then we have an acquisitions manager and a dispositions manager. So we're very virtual. The only local people on the ground is our acquisitions manager in our market. Interesting. That is an interesting model. And obviously you couldn't, you couldn't build that model overnight. It takes time to build something like that. And, and, and this is, by the way, this, I, I want to talk about scaling a wholesaling business because a lot of people, I think this is where they struggle. This is where a lot of people struggle with wholesaling is they become transactionists, Right. It, they're just, they're just doing a bunch of transactions that are run. You talked about wearing 18 different hats. There are a lot of people that never get out of that. And they're, they're just constantly running and running and running. If they do two or three or four deals a month, that's a good month. And they, but they work their dang tail off for it. Right. So it sounds to me like you put a really good team in place. And I definitely want to talk about how you got to that point. We're also going to talk about SEO. You told me off offline that um, a lot of your, your biggest deals come through SEO or some sort of digital marketing, some, some sort of something that you're doing um, online. So I want to talk about that too. I think that would be um, really valuable for a lot of people. And then you are, um, you consider yourself to be a great negotiator too of properties. So I want to hit all of these topics, but before we do that, I want to dig in to what you just said. How does one go from spending the first eight weeks in the business, falling on their face and not doing, you know, just kind of messing everything up to building out a team like this where you say I'm at home right now and I don't even really know. I got up at eight o'clock. I don't even really know what to do. How do, how do you go from point A to point B like that? Well, first thing you've got to do in your business is you've got to generate some of those transactions that we were first talking about. Agreed. Um, I would say is what we did is we, we were committed in the beginning to not spending our capital on things that we would go enjoy. I consider this, this entire last year and a half, a, a severe um, bit of uh, um, gratification delay. Um, we have really been focused on pouring everything back into our business. Uh, if you look at like even companies like Amazon, like the way they scale is they pour everything back in so they can get that ball spinning. Uh, so so, let's, so not, let's not gloss over that. 
That's a huge, huge point. And I did the same thing is that you're literally reinvesting your money back into your business to get it to really to the point to where it could sustain either without you or with your limited role. But you can't do that. In the beginning, cash is everything. You've yeah, got to yeah. have cash to get to that next point. I just did a video on this that so many people are trying to automate their business in the beginning and then they're not even focused on doing transactions and making actual money. So it's a great point. I appreciate that. Yeah. It, it's, it's a tough thing. You know, you got people that graduate college with business degrees and there's not one class in sales in there and without sales, you have no business. So we have a bunch of people that want to totally. sit back and run the business, but you got to know it. So like, you know, before we ever hired anyone, uh, going back to how we did this, you know, we first, uh, my office manager now signed, she was a cold caller for us. And, uh, she grinded since, you know, February of last year calling and generating leads. And, you know, we used a mojo dollar, which is a three line dialer. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have heard or been familiar with. And, you know, the, the biggest thing that we, we did is we stayed consistent. Like I see so many people go, my marketing campaign didn't work. Like, you know, like, well, how many times did you do it? Oh, I tried once. Well, you got to do it six times and then do it again, and again in six months. Like marketing is something that's long and it's trial and error and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's dirty and you don't know if you're ever going to get the return and it takes time to build that process. So we, we were committed to that. And, um, after that I realized that I was doing it way too much time in Podio and not, and, you know, going to appointments still. So I'm still doing all of these other things. Um, so we ended up hiring another cold caller and she built out the processes for us as we did it and documenting, documenting everything guys. Like when you do something, take the time to make a video of you doing it, yeah. take the time to, to write down what you did so you can go and do it more efficiently. That's the biggest thing, documenting everything you're doing. I so. agree. So let, I want to, I want to talk about something you just mentioned. You said you brought on a cold call. Someone was cold calling at first and then she became your, your office manager from far away, sort of like a VA that I, I do want to get to that. How did you, so was, was that your first hire and how did you know what hire to make in the very beginning? No. So we made a ton of mistakes. Um, actually, talk about uh, them. yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we didn't do disc tests. I require every person we hire to go through and take a disc test. Mm. Um, the, we made mistakes because we didn't have core values defined. How can I bring someone into my business that doesn't have the same core values as me? So, you know, for us, it's, uh, is it good for the whole? Um, are they accountable? Is there accountability? Um, you know, is, are they great problem solvers? Like, you know, you can have the best sales guy in the world on your acquisition side, but if he doesn't jive with your culture, Brian, he's never going to truly jive in your company. And it's going to always feel like you're clashing. So we figured out that it's not always best to hire the most qualified person. It's best to find the person that matches our moral set. And like our, you know, John Martinez is the one that I, I, I truly commend for, for a lot of this. It's, you know, you can turn a five or a six out of 10 into a seven or an eight with training. Like, but you can't instill someone to believe in the morals and values of your company. Agreed. And we've had John on our podcast. So definitely guys, we might, we'll link that up in the show notes to go back and listen to John gave us some incredible tips on what to do on a seller appointment, um, how to talk to sellers, how to negotiate. Um, so definitely we'll link that up in the show notes. Definitely check that out, episode out as well. But here's, here's the question. Here's the interesting, interesting question I have for you to Zach. You're talking about all this stuff that real businesses have in place. And you said you kind of messed up cause you didn't have them at first. When did you first realize and, and how and why did you first realize that that was important and that was something you need to instill into your company? Uh, my business partner, Matt, and I got recommended by uh, uh, Max Maxwell to read the book Traction. And uh, once we started realizing that we didn't have a way to track anything and you're just kind of throwing money and, you know, hoping and we were putting bandit signs out. I mean, dude, we were so far all over the place. Everyone, if you're out there and you're in this position right now, I, I've been there. I've woke up at three o'clock in the morning, had bills due next month and not known what I'm supposed to go do today to, to create action. The one thing that I figured out, and this is all that really matters in a wholesale business, you got to make offers and you got to know buyers. If you're not talking to sellers and you're not talking to buyers, you have no business. If you can make one offer a day, if you're not making one offer a day, you don't have a business. I don't care if you go call a realtor or make an offer on a listed house. You got to make offers. You got to get innovation. So that was the thing. We weren't making enough offers. So we figured that out quickly and started making some more offers. There's no question about it. Um, so 
how soon, Zach, should do you recommend someone start to implement like a traction type of culture? Like you said, you read the book Traction that talks a lot, yep. a lot about this EOS type of stuff that we've talked about a lot on our show. How soon should someone start thinking about that if they're brand new to starting a business? Because we talked about cash is, is important in the beginning. How soon should we start implementing these things? I would think after you've done two to three deals over the course of, you know, and 90 days and you, you've got, you know, you're consistently marketing. So first off, you've got to pick one market. I see so many people, they go, well, I'm going to be over here. I've got a JV friend down the road over here and, and you just pick one market, go long, get committed, get to know that market, spend a year and say, I don't care if the best deal in the world falls in your lap in San Francisco, if you're in Houston, Texas, if it's not Houston, Texas, you're not worried about it because that's where people mess up. I feel like they get all over the board and you're already wearing too many hats. Can you wear 18 hats in Houston? Can you wear 18 hats in San Francisco? Can you do all of these things? So it's like, once you've figured out that you want to stay in one market, you've gotten committed to that. You are farming the lists and recommendations that we can get in that if you want, but that have all been listed on these podcasts and you're being consistent and you've got a process that works and you feel like you can train one of those rolls away. The thing you dislike the most is the first thing to take off your plate. I didn't like cold calling. So guess what we did? We got a freaking cold caller. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, if you're not good at doing the website, then, you know, you hire someone to do the website, but like as an entrepreneur, we already done a bunch of stuff. We hated working at jobs. So we've got to remove the things that we don't like. Totally. So This is the, the thing I'm seeing the most right now that, that people are struggling with the most is I've done a few deals and I don't know how to turn me making cash, like, like working my tail off to make some cash. I don't know how to transition from that phase to building a true business. Just what, and you, and you mentioned earlier that that was a little bit of a struggle for you as well, that you kind of fell on your face a little bit. What are some key points or two to help that transition? Well, first thing you got to do is you got time block time for it. Like you can sit there and say you want to do that, but if we're not intentional with our time, like, I mean, if you're got that time, time block, depending on how much time, you know, I'm working in my business, working in your business and working on your business are not the same things. Correct. So separating the time that you spend working in your business and that, and then understanding that there may be a seller lead that goes to voicemail because when we get off task, it takes us almost 30 minutes to refocus anyways. That's like interesting. I got intentional. Like I told my wife, I love you, but I got to be really focused on this right now so we can have time with our son later. Like, yeah. and it's hard. Like, and I'll tell you, I spent 80 hours a week and so did my business partner. Like we gave up, like I put, I let my health get a lot worse. I've been working on it now. Like I gained like 50 pounds doing this. I, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest. That's brutal. I gave up sleepless nights. Like, um, you know, uh, you, you sacrifice, I pour all my energy into it. I mean, it, this is what takes most people seven to 10 years or don't ever build it. Like yeah. it, it's, it's brutal. But if you ever want to get out of a job and have a business, I, it's the only way. So Zach, give us some actionable steps. Like okay. What, what's, what's one or two actionable things that we can do to get that, to make that transition? Write down every single process and step in your business from the point of where does the lead come into my company? How do we generate leads? What are all of those? and make a mind map chart. And if you don't know how to make a mind map chart, after you've drawn it all out on a piece of paper, you go on Upwork and you find a VA that specializes in mind map chart. Everything that you are not good at, there is someone out there willing to do it for a task for money to help you exceed. But you have to know what you want. That's where I get, I think a lot of people are like, I want a cold caller. Okay, well, do you know how to cold call? Do you know how to deal with seller, seller interaction and match modeling, making sure if they love cats, you love cats. Like, you know, all of these kind of things that make that person successful, you've got to be able to write all of those things out and expectations like, well, I know that every day when I get on my mojo dollar that I get between 600 and 700 contacts on a three line dollar. Well, if I'm paying a VA for eight hours a day and they're getting 400 dials in, do I know that there's a problem or am I being a silly entrepreneur and throwing money down the drain? So it's like, if you don't have those things, which I see many people do, they just hire and they're like, oh, well, there's a cold caller and we might get some leads. And then I see it later that VA's fire didn't get paid and someone posted about it in a group and, you know, or, or whatever, it just doesn't work out and they pour all their money down the drain. So it's just, you got to have those processes and you've got to think step by step, like McDonald's is amazing because anyone can go in there and do it. You've got to literally write it out. So a child can come in and go, okay, I log into Mojo Dialer. I sign into this. Like, 
it's very, it's tedious. But you do it once. But you do it once, you make a video of it, you save it to a Google Drive, and when you hire someone, here's your hiring packet. These are your videos. Oh, I have this question. Hey, it's in the video. Please review the information. And it's not to be mean, because I've got to go work on getting another person's role automated. And I'm already sacrificing time. Like, And I will tell you guys, there's no like four-hour work day to do this. Like, It's brutal, but if you want it bad enough, just like you wanted to quit that job and get that first wholesale check, isn't it worth it to get someone to go get all those checks for you? I mean, I thought it was. Love it. So that's scaling, guys. Like to really take your business from making that first check or two or three to actually start building a true business. Just like Zach said, you got to work on your business as much as in your business. But in the very beginning, you got to work in your business. 100%. And then that way you at least know, like Zach said, it's, it's perfect. You have to know how many calls it takes. You have to know how to, you have to know how to do all these things and you can't know how to do all that just by reading some books. You got to go do it and you got to put it into action and then you can start teaching other people on your team to do it. Love it. Great stuff. I want to switch gears to SEO because I think that this is, this is going to help a lot of people in the very beginning. Um, I was told by a guru in the very beginning, never done a scene, didn't even know anything about real estate. I was told to go get a seller's website, a buyer's website, a private money website, and do all this stuff and spend all this money. So I teach people today, you're not focused on that in the beginning. In the beginning, you gotta go out and make money. You need to learn how to make money in the beginning. Then we can start to build out our team, our websites, things like that. You built out a website. I want you to talk about this. You told me off air that you do, you have carrot but you also have done some other things to kind of enhance it. Absolutely. So tell us what, so tell us about that. Yeah. So Trevor and his team at Carrot have just been, I mean, phenomenal for us. Uh, you know, when I first started, I'm, I'm not a web guy. So there's many of us out there. If you're not a computer person, this is one of those things, like I said, find someone that's excellent at it. These guys are excellent at it. So we did a couple of deals. Like I said, you know, directly mailed them, banged on doors, cold call people. Okay. I've got some checks. Talk to my partner, Matt. We need a website. Um, you know, and, uh, so we realized that carrot was a good fit based on some other investors we had spoke with, uh, got that going. We were doing, we started with posting the, you know, the very articles that we first, you know, we're going with, um, and it worked for us. Great. Got us up there in the rankings in the first, you know, four or five months. But I soon realized that, you know, if you want to be the best at something, you've got to get your own content. You've got to get your own particular niche items written. So we started really focusing on long tail phrase keywords and some of those things that- What does that mean for people that don't? Like, you know, so it's not sell my house fast, Knoxville. It's, you know, uh, if my house burned down, who could buy it for cash or any of those kind of things like uh, what to do in the case of foreclosure. And so what we did, we started writing guides and we started solving problems and giving away solutions that weren't even about them buying or selling their home to, or sorry, selling their home to us. And we started noticing an uptick in traffic with regular organic content that wasn't even just, I'm not even talking about being salesy. I'm talking about offering solutions on yeah. blogs, yep. uh, you know, mom blogs. And all that. So, so my partner got really, really, really into this. So you got to understand, I had someone full time building all of this out while I dealt with buyers, sellers, deals, and, and all of those things that were in our business already. So we took a huge sacrifice. I gave up 50% and I realized this is big money. dude. We did one deal. You know, first deal we did was like $32,000. And I was just like, I think our average fee at the time was like five or seven. And I was like, dude, take all that money and figure out what you need. And he's like, it's not about spending money with SEO, man. It's about getting the right content and all of those things. And it takes time, right? Time. So time. Yeah. So we're number one in Chattanooga and we're number one in Knoxville. And like, man, I could literally not get out of bed and literally make money off SEO. Like it is the conversion rate for us is I think three out of like 10 leads on average. It's insanely high. And so, you attribute that to original content that you guys developed. Correct. So getting featured on Forbes or AOL News or Entrepreneur Magazine, like the power of the, the authority, guys. It's all, about, it's all about the authority of the page. So like you think about, you know, in your town, like offline, if you're not a computer person, like you look at a big building that's been in town for since the 1700s or something like that. That building is historic and commands authority of the city. So think of a web page that's got a lot of traffic to it, been around a long time has a huge amount of authority. And by getting yourself on it and that content backlinking and following to your website juices your content up the rankings. 
Now, did you have, and I know we're getting a little technical and you may not have the answers because you're not the technical guy when it comes to this stuff. But so I, I did that with our, with our website um, for, that was Alaria. I know we re- rebranded, which a lot of you guys know that. But with Alaria, we were backlinking from Forbes. We were backlinking from all these like huge high ranking authority, 99s and 100s on authority. Did you pay someone to help you with that like I did? Uh, no, actually. So my partner kind of learned as he went and has actually, uh, over the last two years really gotten extremely excellent at SEO. So he kind of, uh, taught himself an entire skill set, and, um, you know, is building another company around that skill set. So wow. it was a lot of trial and error, but I mean, it was all of that R and D that R and D research and development time was spent. And, you know, he, he listened to a lot of podcasts and spent a lot of time learning. I mean, all the information's on the internet guys, like, it's For just, sure. you know, For it's, sure. So Zach, like when, when you say all this stuff, and cause I've kind of been in that world just a little bit and, and it's, it's pretty daunting. Like mm-hmm. it, there's a lot, a lot, a lot, lot to that for the average person out there that they know they're not going to do stuff like that. What do you recommend? I recommend first off, you know, doing some research on where you feel comfortable getting a website. What's the best way to the best business people I do business with. I've all been referral, right? Totally. Generally for me. Uh, so uh, get some referrals from other people that are have what you want, right? They have the success that you want. Seek their advice. And then I would seek counsel of some other people that interacted with that person and verify that advice of where to go. And then I would spend my money on, you know, a, something that can be turnkey for me, like a website. And then I would look to find a company to manage it for me. And you need to have the understanding and expectation that you may go six months of paying them for that service until you start to see those returns. And if you are not prepared to pay someone for that extended amount of time to see results, then don't do it to begin with because you're just going to end up spending money and be yeah. frustrated. Totally. So that's, that's honestly like we didn't have a lot of success with PPC. So I just, you know, and maybe that was us not having the right people doing it. There are guys out there that crush it, but for us like SEO and, and cold calling have just been, you know, so fruitful and it's such a low cost model. Everything that we've built, you know, and just tying back in is, yeah. is a low cost model. Low cost in dollars, but high cost in time. Absolutely. So we sold, we sold our souls in the beginning uh, to, to, to get it set up. But, you know, if you have the right leverage and the right systems, like if it takes, you know, 10 callers to get my 20 deals and, you know, I don't, that doesn't bother me one bit. If I, if I know that the data is good, phone numbers are good, the systems and the scripts and, you know, all those things are in place in the processes, then, it should just turn money. For sure. So I think a lot of us are in a situation where a lot of people that listen to this may not have a whole lot of money, but the good news is if you don't have a whole lot of money, you should have a lot of time. <laughs> so start putting your time to good use. Um, definitely pick up on some of these tips that Zach's talking about. Can I say what I would do if I had no money and I had to go get a deal today? Yeah, of course. So you guys want to know how to go. First off, the first thing you need to have, if you don't have buyers, there's an auction, I guarantee you, between now and the end of the month in your town. There are people there to buy houses for cash that have not seen the houses they're buying and are paying the most for the houses sight unseen at a foreclosure auction. Go network with buyers. Go to your local RIA. I'm sure they have a whole slew of people that handed over their email information. Those have been the two best places for us to generate buyers just off of those two resources, and they're quick and immediate. Someone will answer the phone or an email at a RIA. I'm sure, and get you the member list if you sign up. So that's, buyers is not an excuse. Um, And then if I would drive and I would literally get the free foreclosure list from the paper, because it's one printed, I guarantee you can get a copy today or it's online. And I would go knock on every one of those doors today and I would say, hey, my name is Zach, I'm a local investor. I just wanted to see if you knew anyone would be interested in selling their property. You do not mention anything about their distress. Your job as a wholesaler is to get people to tell you everything that you already know. It's like a lawyer. Uh-oh. Yeah. And I would go and I would look for vacant houses and talk to neighbors and get out of my comfort zone. And I guarantee totally. you, if you did that and you made an offer every day for a month, you would do a deal. There's no way if you make that much action on looking at properties with severe distress, so you're not going to find someone that's like, yes, thank you. I'm done. That's how you'll know. They don't care about price. They're just done. So I said like a lawyer because that's what a lawyer should do. A lawyer is asking, a lawyer is never going to ask a question that they don't already know the answer to. So I do that. So when, when I have to make a call and I say I have one of my coaching students, they'll tell me um, everything about the deal. And they're like, I need you to call him. I'm like, all right, I'll call him. And I'm asking them all the same questions 
that I already have all the information for because I know that they're going to say it either different, differently, a little bit differently, or they could say something extra that they didn't already say that so I can get a lot, I can get as much detail as possible to where I can, you know, empathize with them and negotiate with them, Absolutely. which, which is a great segue into our, the last segment here. I want to talk to you about negotiating. So once you finally, and you kind of mentioned this, Zach, that you're going around knocking on doors in the beginning. What do you, besides your opening line, how do you actually negotiate with a seller to get them to agree to, a uh, to where you're going to make a 20, 30, $40,000 wholesale spread. Absolutely. So, you know, it starts out first off with the conversation of this is my biggest thing that a lot of wholesalers make a mistake of is listening to understand rather than listening to respond. We are always so amped up to get our word in and, Oh, Mr. Seller, this and that, or, Oh man, you know, this and that, like listen to what they're saying, think, pause. It's okay to not immediately open your mouth when you hear someone speak to you and then calculate your response. Like it, we get so eager, right? It's like you got the girl to say yes and go on the date. It's, it's your job not to mess it up. They already responded to your marketing in some fashion. You're there. I like to think of Hitch sometimes that, that movie when I'm, when I'm thinking of this stuff and, you know, listening to where they need to be, it may not be price. You know, it could be that they need, you know, they, they need to move. They're buried alive. They may not have a mover. That might be the reason that they don't sign with someone is because they, you know, do you have someone to help you move? You know, all of these type of questions, like if you notice hoarders and stuff like that, offer them a storage unit. They may not be willing to move up, get rid of all their stuff. Yeah, that's how we buy hoarders houses. Half the time we offer to pay for a storage unit for a year and put it in the purchase price. Mm. But it's all about how we present things. Um, so if I'm in there, I walk the property and, you know, I always put it on them. I'm like, you know, what do you think it would cost to fix this property up? What, what, what do you think it would take to make this property Pinterest ready? Because let's, let's face it, guys, wives are the reason we buy property, right? It's the kitchen, the bathroom, and the master bedroom that sell a house. What is it going to cost to make it so, you know, the average first and second time home buyer spouse is going to want to purchase that property? So I put it on them, and, and there'll be a lot of truth tellers. And you guys are like, oh, I can do this $15,000. Really, man, how did you arrive at that number? And I, I put it on them because I, I make sure I'm informed on what things cost. So I advise you guys before you're out making a bunch of offers meet a contractor, get an idea of what things cost or come up with a square footage estimator for, you know, to get a ballpark of what things are going to be and be conservative. You know, I'm always conservative. I don't take the highest comps or do any of those kind of things. So, um, we're, we're constantly putting it back on the seller. And then, you know, I, I don't ever chase a deal. I make sure that they know we use the same John Martinez, the, the, you know, empathetic selling that a lot of people do. And I may not be able to purchase this property from you today. I have a lot of other view properties to view. What's going to happen to this property if we don't come up with a solution today? Is it going to last another winter? Think about where you guys live. You know, are the pipes going to freeze on this vacant house? Are you in Chicago? You know, is there going to be, you know, is there theft in the area? Do you know where the truly, a truly attracts crime reporting? Like is this house vacant now that tenant left, you know, you got to be informed on your area guys. That gives you the power negotiation for sure and so you've gone through john martinez's training tell us what you think about that and is that something you recommend for people that have been doing this business for a little bit oh, of time? you can take that and if you could create a roof selling business you could go and take this training and do anything with it his sales training is not just real estate specific it's designed to get you to psychologically relate with someone overcome objection and make a win-win situation and he makes sales not personal yeah. while making it still personal at the same time. Like it's not an attack. And that's, and that's what's great for, even if you're an, an introverted person, you know, I think being with, with John's style of sale is, you know, you're just saying, Hey, I'm, I'm here. And you know, I, I want to make sure you have the best solution possible. For and sure. if it's not me, that's okay. And you win people over by being that way. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Just literally the other day I went on an appointment and I'm just, you, you mentioned pausing a lot. Don't, don't feel like we have to rush to respond to things. I'm just out there in the, in the backyard with the guy. He's got like a really nice lot, really nice view. And I'm just sitting there. And I just got my mouth shut. And he's just, he would talk, he'd say something for a couple minutes and then he wouldn't say anything else. And I would just keep my I wasn't saying anything. And I was doing that on purpose to try to get him to, and he kept, and he kept talking and kept talking. You know, those people that just feel like they have to talk. They're the best sellers. They're, they're the ones that are going to fill that, that dead silence. You just let them talk and be a good listener. Being a great listener is important. 
That's great stuff. Um, John Martinez's stuff, by the way, I've never been to a sales training, which is definitely something that's on my list. I definitely need to do, but definitely go back and listen to our podcast that we did with him. Um, he just gave us a lot of tremendous information. He also does a lot of free content. If you're subscribed to his new letter, he gives you a lot of good nuggets. So definitely check him out for sure. We'll, we'll link all that up. So Zach, before we go, man, what, what's next for you? You said you're just sitting at home. You don't really know what to do. Oh no, no <laughs> joking. Um, I'm just grateful. Uh, so right now we're getting ready to really delve into the Chattanooga market, um, full steam ahead. It's been an auxiliary market for us. Um, and, uh, we're, we're launching a company, um, to offer, uh, my partner is stepping out of our real estate business entirely. And we're going to be launching a product, uh, hopefully soon for kind of our systems and train and some of the, the tools we use to train our staff and, you know, how to, help people make better hiring decisions. I feel like it's so important, man. Like, and I, I stress it again to people like to have people in your business, take a disc test, mm. go to TonyRobbins.com. It's free. It's not a couple hundred dollars. And you guys, you can all take a disc test. And now when you know what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are, and you can help people have a better role in your business. So, uh, you know, we're going to focus on that and uh, improving our process. And um, I'm going to finish flipping this, this house and get a sold and uh, something built for my, for my wife so she doesn't strangle me. I'm not allowed to move us into any more investment property. Um, so <laughs> Can but, I get uh, that point hopefully, hopefully uh, we're going to be able to, you know, get some more messages out there and give away some more content and, uh, you know, take definition of being a go giver. And I want to again, Brian credit you. Your book has been uh, tremendous in my mindset. Uh, I was the one that was competitive when I first started this business and, you know, I do some deals and I'd be worried like, Oh, I don't want to talk to that wholesaler. I don't want to do that. Or man, when we just became the person that just loved doing deals and being around people and just kind of making it fun loving and I want to help them solve a problem because, you know, a wholesaler with a deal without a buyer is a problem just as much as a motivated seller. It's a motivated wholesaler. So, um, you know, being that solution for those people, awesome. we just, it pours in, man. So I, I appreciate that kind of paradigm shift. Uh, it definitely brought a lot of perspective from your book. I appreciate that. That means a lot to me. I want to ask you this though. I, you kind of brought up another, another topic that, that I feel like I want to hit on. And cause I listened to you on Tom, Cr we'll link that up too. Um, I'm really, every time I say that, I'm talking to the guys who do my show notes. No, you're <laughs> let's, good. let's link up the podcast that Zach did with Tom Kroll on wholesaling Inc. recently. I listened to that and you talked a lot about how you um, broke down a market because to get into do the the Knoxville market like like the question would be like why Knoxville well I want I want you to answer the question why Chattanooga next why not Nashville why not you know Asheville or something going the other way in North Carolina you know why why Chattanooga how did you determine that that was the next spot for you uh, it's based on cash transactions and uh, my business partners from Nashville and it's been a cooling market and most of our large, his buyer pool there has been investing in Chattanooga heavily and based on the amount they're buying, what they're paying for currently based on our relationships and our marketing down there, just from, we literally set up SEO in a market about five, six months before we really planned to go in there. And we waited until we were in that point and now we're going to pour on the gas. So wow. it, it, it's, it's just, it's, uh, you know, nothing's really appreciating a whole bunch down there, but it's a solid rental market. Cash and we want to be in a lot of rental markets in the, the next downturn. If you guys are wholesaling and you're strictly selling to flippers, you need to really be working on your rental buyers list. Like it, I'm not saying a crash is coming. I don't know. No one knows. But my whole point is if you don't have a good rental buyers list, you will be in a famine state. I agree. And Birmingham is a, is a total cash flow market, just like Knoxville, just like uh, Chattanooga would be. When you said pour gas on the fire, you've already done the work. What do you mean exactly by that? What else would you do? Uh, we would scale up based on response rate, like in certain zip codes, like we'll literally, uh, um, you know, doing ringless voicemail blasts, uh, cold calling, uh, run some PPC ads, Facebook ads. Got it. Uh, potentially do bandit signs. I mean, I get to, if we need to get door knockers, we'll get it. But if we can start making money in a neighborhood, man, I just, I just try to go along and figure out what works. It's incredible so, you know, stuff. You're never going to get the same seller. Like if you guys are thinking like, do I cold call or do I mail them or do I do ringless voicemail? Trial three, try, try a, an employee approach from a large company, try a personal touch approach. Like different sellers are going to respond to different types of marketing. For sure. So, Awesome stuff, man. I really do appreciate the values giving us some, I, I like action steps. That's why I've asked you like four questions. Like, like what, like what could we do? And I think that the, our, our, our audience gets a lot of value 
out of being able to actually go and do something. Because I think there are a lot of people out there that's just talk kind of in generalities and talk about theory. And you've done a really good job of uh, giving us some good action steps. So I appreciate you, Zach. Any last words before we go? No, I just, uh, you know, making offers, guys, I'm serious. If you make offers and you go meet to RIA meetings and meet buyers, you will be doing deals. If you are not making offers and you are piddling with business cards, website design, you know, over-educating without action, you're never going to get a check. Get out there and make some offers. Totally agree. Couldn't agree more. And I got that from one of my first mentors, Joe McCall, who told me you've got to be making five offers. You got to be talking to five new sellers a day and making at least one or two offers a day. So make sure you guys are doing that. You're never going to be successful. You're never going to do a deal unless you are talking to sellers and making offers. Zach, thank you so much. Nexus Home Buyers. If people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way that they can reach out to you? Uh, they can contact us on the website or Zach at nexushomebuyers.com. And if anyone has any questions about maybe SEO service companies or anything like that, our company we're launching is uh, Rebar Marketing, R-E-I-B-A-R-M-A-R-K-E-T-I-N-G.com. And it's got a, you can leave your name and uh, email and we'll reach out to you once we're ready to launch. That's um, awesome. Yeah, he, he won't launch anything until it's perfect. So, <laughs> When is the expected launch day for that? Is that uh, like our spring 2019. Uh, we're going to have some data clients. Like our biggest thing is to make sure we don't overload anyone or not deliver. Um, but we won't be taking on more than one client per market. Like that's something that we're passionate about. I don't like, there's no way I can give value to someone in a market if I've got someone else that's com I'm competing against them and making profiting off of it. So it's, that's most important thing to me is to help someone get free because SEO, dude, I mean, it, it changed my entire life. So that's the number one rule to sales right there. Scarcity and urgency. And Zach just created a little bit of scarcity there, one per market. So you better get to emailing him. Um, so you can, or go to the website and put your email, put your information in if you're interested in this. So just real quick to clarify, Zach, Z-A-C-H at nexushomebuyers.com is the best way to get a hold of you. Absolutely, man. Awesome, man. Zach, I appreciate it. You've, done, you've given us some incredible value today. We really do appreciate you guys. If you like what you heard, please hit that subscribe button. We love you so much. Don't forget to rate us and review us. We'll see you next time.